Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, on behalf of Corsier Tucson and Acadia Healthcare, uh, we have also Sony Lee from uh, another treatment placement specialist from Tucson, Arizona. I know a lot of you are her guests as well. And myself, um, we just again want to thank you for attending this informative webinar. Um, so now I have the privilege of introducing our speaker, Dr. Levin. Um, Michael Levin uh, is a psychiatrist and addictionologist in private practice in Denver. He's had prior careers as an electrical engineer, a neuroscience researcher, and an internist. His approach to treating addiction combines elements from all of these fields, along with his 40 years of practicing meditation and seven years of psychoanalytical training. He has a lifelong interest in what it means to be human, and more especially, what it means to be human in the presence of another human. He was one of the physicians involved in the phase two clinical trials of the MAPS study on the use of MDMA in the treatment of PTSD. He has been treating people suffering from addiction and mental health for over 25 years. On a personal note, I have known Dr. Levin as a close colleague and friend. He's one of the most kindest, authentic, and wittiest individuals I know. He is greatly respected by his clients and all who cross his path. Please welcome Dr. Michael Levin. Thank you, Diane, and uh, welcome to Psychedelics, everybody. And uh, thank you for coming. Um, this is my contact information. If you guys have any questions, comments, uh, or just want to talk about this stuff, feel free to call me, text me, email me. Um, I don't have any financial affiliations except for with my clients. Um, so I'm going to talk about the mental health uses of psychedelics. Um, and I'm going to use the brain as a scaffolding for the talk. And in the first half, I'll talk about how psychedelics work. And then in the second half, I will talk about the clinical research. And then I'll end with a little bit on um, meditation. And after the first half, there'll be 15 minutes of questions. And then at the end, there will be as well. Um, so some of my slides will have a um, have red um, a font at the top. And what this means is um, these are ways that I've sort of put things together. Uh, so for the most part, I'm going to give you guys stuff from the research. But um, every once in a while, I'll sort of tie things together. Maybe the research will catch up with me and show me right, maybe wrong. Um, but I just want to make it clear that those are um, my ideas. So what is it about these drugs? There's really no other drugs that have this sort of range of impact or this variety of uses. Uh, these were a few of the fields uh, that I could think of that um, um, that have been influenced by psychedelics. Um, and I bet you could come up with some more. Uh, medicine, philosophy, politics, uh, anthropology, religion and spirituality, neuroscience, the arts. And these are some of the medicinal uses that are being investigated and have been investigated. Addiction, end of life anxiety and depression, PTSD, major depression, anxiety disorders, uh, eating disorders. So why is this? Why do they have such an impact? Um, it's because these medicines sort of hit, um, hit the reset button on the self. They really alter the way we are. They um, change the way we are in the world. They change um, cognition, awareness, salience, and they change perception, and not just of our external world, but our internal world as well. So really to talk about something that works in this way, uh, we really have to forget the medical model. The medical model is that somebody comes to my office, um, they have a range of symptoms, um, I come up with a differential diagnosis. I do some tests to um, determine the most likely diagnosis, and then I have some understanding of the physiology, and I'll it, um, advise an intervention based on the physiology. Uh, you can't really do that with these drugs. For one, um, diagnosis just doesn't seem to matter that much. Um, and for another, I can't just give somebody two tabs of LSD and say, um, go take these and call me if you have any problems and uh, I'll see you in a few months. 
Um, before I talk about the medical uses, I'll say one word about politics and one that is that any drug that sort of alters our self is going to generate a lot of fear. We're um, pretty attached to the way we think things work. Um, and uh, Nixon's biggest fear when he um, outlawed um, psychedelics was that if the youth had access to psychedelics, we'd have nobody to man the factories. And then on the other end, um, there are people who say we should just put LSD in the water um, and that if we did, the world would be a much kinder place, there'd be no war and, um, and we'd take a lot better care of the planet. I think, uh, I think we're somewhere in between. Um, by the way, if you're interested in the political history in the US of psychedelics, um, there's a great read in Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. Um, and that reminds me, um, I don't know if any of you guys saw 60 Minutes last week, but uh, there was a segment on um, psychedelics uh, there. Um, and that might be available on YouTube, I don't know. So what do psychedelics do? How do they work? Um, and before I start, I'll just say that in my practice, um, I think of the brain and the mind as being mirrors of one another, that um, any change that you see in our brain, you also see some sort of a change in mind, and any mind change, you see a change in the brain. If you look at any studies um, on psychedelics in the brain, what they will refer to is a dissolution of the default mode network. So I'm gonna spend a little time talking about what this is. Um, the default mode network was first delineated by Marcus Raichel. Um, he's at the University of Washington, St. Louis. And um, what he noticed was he was doing a lot of scans on people where he would give them a task to find out um, what parts of the brain lit up with certain tasks. And before scanning their brains during the task, he would do a baseline scan. And what he started to notice was that people, when they started working on the task, at the parts of the brain um, before that, um, there were some parts that deactivated. And he started to wonder, well, what, what deactivates and what's going on during that time? So he started to ask people, so what are you doing before you um, start doing the task that I give you? And they said things like um, daydreaming, my mind was wandering, I was just thinking about stuff. And he found that the parts of the brain that correlate with daydreaming and mind wandering were the uh, posterior cingulate cortex, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex, and the angular gyrus. This is the uh, posterior cingulate cortex. It's in the back of the brain in the midline. And it's associated with um, awareness of the self. Um, and so that can be it's very something very simple, like I'm just aware that I'm walking, but for the most part, it's things like um, thinking about ourselves in the past or fantasizing about ourselves in the future or thinking about ourselves in relationship to others. And this is the medial prefrontal cortex. It's also in the midline, but um, in the front of the brain. And what it's associated with is about um, sort of making decisions about self. Um, things like, um, is this important for the story of myself? Um, 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 or making decisions about people that, um, that we care about. Um, and what he also found is that when he gave people a test, so that network turned off and another network turned on and he called that the test positive network. And there are some parts of the brain that are specific to certain tasks. Um, but there are also some, some that are just um, associated with any time we're working on something. And the task positive network and the default mode network are anti-correlated. What that means is that if your task positive network is active, your default mode network is inactive. And if your default mode is inactive, your task positive network, um, um, if your default mode is, um, uh, network is active, then your uh, task positive network is inactive. And so these common parts were the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, and the insula. Um, so what do we need when we're um, working on something? Well, we need to make decisions. We need to access memory. We need to know what's important. We need to control emotions. And that's what these part of the brains do. And by the way, I mentioned that default mode network is disrupted with psychedelics. Um, 
but it's the psychedelic brain does not look the same as the test positive network. These two parts in the front of the brain, the um, purple and the dark blue, those are the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. This uh, deep structure in the middle of the brain is the insula. So it seems to me that our sort of normal waking experience is one of working on a task and then daydreaming, working on a task and then daydreaming. Um, for example, working on this talk, I might be um, focused on the talk and then I might thinking, be thinking, oh, I wonder what people are going to think about this. Then I work on the talk and then I might think, um, oh, I wonder how my wife is. Or I might be working on the talk again and then think, I wonder what's for dinner. Um, so our brain sort of alternates back and forth between the uh, default mode network and the um, task positive network. There was a study, I think it was out of Harvard, where um, they taught people how to, when they, whenever they were paged, um, to remember exactly what they were doing at that moment and write it down. And, um, and then they just sort of page people at work randomly throughout the day. And they just ask them, what were you doing? And on average, about 50% of the time, people were daydreaming. Um, I know there's some people who are much more able to focus and some people much less, but on average, it's about 50%, I think. Uh, this, uh, this is the heart talking to the brain. It says, why are you working? I haven't, com I haven't finished complaining about work yet. So things start to get interesting if we um, start to think about, well, what is daydreaming? Um, it's not random. Um, in fact, those two brain areas I talked about, they're about self, right? So for the most part, when we're daydreaming, we're thinking about us. And for the most part, when we think about us, we're thinking about problems that we have, uh, what's wrong. And our default mode has very close connections with theory of mind structures and with autobiographical memory structures. So, um, so theory of mind is the, um, it's like how we think um, our minds work and how we think other people's minds work and how we think our minds might work with other people. And then the autobiographical memory is just the story that we tell about ourselves. So our default mode uses um, these theories of mind and the story about ourselves to construct our daydreams. This is kind of a cartoon drawing of uh, theory of mind networks, um, sort of uh, um, mostly around the uh, superior temporal sulcus. This is a study looking at brain um, parts that are active during uh, autobiographical memory. A number of papers um, looking at default modes since 2001 when Marcus Rakel first uh, delineated this have increased exponentially. Now there's several hundreds and a lot of this literature is starting to talk about the default mode network as a potential neurological basis of self and I'm like how do we get from daydreaming to self um, and um, so I have asked myself that question quite a bit and um, I think one way to look at it is just think about well what why would we do this why would we spend half our time uh, uh, daydreaming um, and what what I say is the way I put it together, but it's based on the work of um, several neuroscientists. One is uh, Robin Carr Harris, who's at the Imperial College of London. Um, and he's interested in um, sort of psychoanalytic correlates of uh, brain and uses uh, psychedelics to um, investigate that. Neil Seth at Oxford uses psychedelics to um, look at the nature of consciousness. Uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett is very interested in how we sort of, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, um, create emotions. But she's also interested in the brain as a predictor, that our brains, well, a big purpose of our brain is to help us predict what's about to happen um, and in so doing we can be ready for it we can um, uh, and therefore uh, protect ourselves if there's something dangerous and there's Alison Gopnik um, she holds dual positions in the psychology department and the philosophy department at Berkeley and she's interested in children especially four-year-olds and then Richard Davidson who um, has been studying the brain of long-term meditators um, for 40 years. So this was the 
first purpose I came up with, and that it's um, we sort of reconfirm our idea of how it all works. Um, we um, uh, we want to um, sort of have some sense that we know what's happening. And um, we're always a protagonist in our daydreams. Um, it doesn't seem like it really matters whether we're here or failure. What I know about me is that if I'm well-fed, well-rested, uh, well-resourced, that I'm often the hero. And if I'm not, then I'm often the failure in my daydreams. And we also sort of reconfirm our theory of mind and um, the story of our lives. Um, but if you look a little bit deeper, um, what you'll notice is that the daydreams that we have often have the same one, two, or three subtexts um, that in some way it's sort of the same story over and over again. And I was thinking this is kind of like Gilligan's Island. Um, I know I'm dating myself a bit here, but when I was a kid, I would run home from school every day to watch another rerun of Gilligan's Island. And if you think about it, Gilligan's Island was always the same story. Um, it was these seven people, they're stranded on this island. They would come up with some brilliant idea of how to get off. Gilligan would do something to mess it up. Everybody would get mad at him, then they forgive him. So our daydreams are kind of like this, um, that we have sort of the same story. We might um, use different uh, settings, different characters, um, different time periods, like in our past, um, our future, and um, but in some way there's often the same story underneath. And our subtexts, they really aren't things like um, paying bills. Um, so we might be thinking about paying bills, but my experience is um, if, if we're thinking about paying bills and we're not having much emotional content in those thoughts, then what we're really doing is we're sort of switching into the task of pain bills. But if there's a lot of emotional impact, um, then um, the emotional impact is usually about some underlying subtext, like um, um, a common subtext I see is um, there's things that I should do and things that I want to do. And um, what I really want to be doing is this, and what I'm really having to do is uh, pay bills. Or another is um, nobody ever takes care of me, so I have to pay the bills. Um, um, so uh, subtexts are things like um, no matter where I go, I never belong. Uh, people never see me, recognize me, think I have anything important to say. Um, people think I'm a bully. There's nobody there to help or I'm shy. It's, it's these kind of things. So the first purpose of um, default mode network is um, to reconfirm our notions of how it works, but always with these kind of similar subtexts of the problems that we're working on. Uh, the second purpose I came up with was to protect us. Um, and for the most part, um, I think what we're trying to protect ourselves is from negative feelings these days. There's not a lot of saber-toothed tigers out there. Um, and uh, the truth is that in childhood, um, we all have these kind of overwhelming um, emotional events. And um, these, um, uh, we, given whatever our temperament is and whatever our um, uh, environment is, we develop these kind of um, mechanisms to make sure we never have those again. And these become the subtext um, of our, um, of our daydreams. And um, their purpose is to try to look out for what's about to happen and protect ourselves from it. This is Doria. She says, and I'm so defensive that I actually work to make people dislike me so I won't feel bad when they do. Um, the third purpose I came up with was they really do confirm our um, idea of who we are. In a way, these subtexts define us. Um, um, and the way we are with everything else. Um, and Neil Seth says, um, it feels like there's a self doing the perceiving, but our self itself is a perception. Um, and the neurological research tends to um, show this over and over. Um, and the fourth purpose I came up with was, um, it seems like in a big way, we sort of relate to the people in our lives through our subtext. Um, a lot of the way we relate is that we're 
projecting our subtext onto others and they're projecting theirs onto us. So our brain does a lot um, and it does a lot um, more than, um, than just protect us and get stuff done, but um, it spends a lot of time doing these two things. Um, so um, this way of protecting us is um, that we um, we sort of interpret the way things happen. So if you think about it, moment to moment, we've got the world happening, and then we've got our internal experience, and then our brain sort of um, decides what this all means. It interprets it, um, and I call that part of the brain that um, it does the interpreting. I call it the uh, interpretive apparatus, um, and that's mostly in the default mode. But one of the things about an interpretation, and, and um, some of it's unconscious, um, some of it's conscious, um, is that we can know what's about to happen. We can, um, and in knowing what's about to happen, we can be ready to act and we can uh, protect ourselves from harm. So things kind of go along fine as long as the world looks enough like um, our interpretation, um, things are fine. But when the world, either our external world or our internal world, just doesn't fit with the idea of our idea of the way things work, then we have to make a decision. We either have to decide that um, our interpretation is right and sort of forget that the world just did something different, um, or we have to change our interpretation based on um, what the world did, um, like I said, internal world or external world. And it turns out that angular gyrus that I mentioned before, that's part of the default mode, it's in um, part of what it does is it's help us, it helps us make that decision. It helps us decide, um, do I hang on to my interpretation um, or do I, um, do I change it based on what just happened? And this is where the angular gyrus sits. Um, this says, warning, objects and mirror may bear no relation to reality. Um, so this learning, this changing our interpretation, um, children are a lot better at it than adults, and it seems like um, the older we get, the more we hang on to our interpretations. Um, and this capacity of us adults um, to hang on to our ideas um, in spite of reality really never ceases to amaze me. We're really good at it. And I think it's for a couple of reasons. Um, yeah. These uh, interpret are difficult to change. One, because we do identify with them. Um, it's what we call me. Um, and also because they are designed to protect us. And uh, we don't want to let go of our protective strategies. Um, by the way, um, default mode, even though these subtexts are about problems, um, they um, there's like... Um, very rigid, um, less open to new experience kinds of uh, default modes. And there's more that, um, that would be something like uh, suicidal depression, um, OCD. And then there's default modes that are more open to new experience and, um, um, and more complex and less, um, um, uh, less, um, uh, less rigid. Um, so, but even so, I think the default mode is inherently unhappy, um, and, uh, it's for a few reasons. One, it's because it always thinks of self as self-separate from the rest of the world. Um, and another is that they're always on the lookout for threat. Um, that's what protection is, is, um, to look out for where something uh, difficult might be in the horizon. And then, um, another thing is that um, we we never really can um, have a clear notion of how things work. The world is just too complex. Um, it's too dynamic. Um, and so what it's really trying to do is grasp something that's ungraspable. So it's kind of inherently unhappy, um, even though there are happier versions and un, uh, unhappier versions. Um, and because of that, um, it's um, it feels good when we're not in it. Um, and so, how how do we um, get out of default mode? What uh, what 
what things happen that, um, how do we engage in our lives in different ways that um, turn the default mode off, that uh, deactivate it. Well, one I already talked about, it's a task positive network. Um, so working on a task, that might mean uh, being at work. Um, it also might be um, watching TV, it might be working on a hobby. And what I've seen is that there are workaholics out there um, and people who just can't stop doing things. And um, I often think when I see that, that these are people who are just trying to get away from their default mode. Um, another way is what psychedelics do, and I'm going to call this complex brain. Um, and um, like I said earlier, complex brain is not the same as a test positive network. Um, this was a study um, looking at what areas of the brain deactivate um, when um, um, we take psychedelics. Um, so the Parts in blue show us which parts deactivate, and as you can see, the posterior cingulate cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex um, deactivate when we take psychedelics. Um, you see this picture all over the psychedelic literature. Um, so on the left is um, a normal brain. Um, it shows the what these guys did was they found a, um, a way to find out what parts of the brain are connected. Um, so they did fMRIs on people and looked at the number of connections. And if you look at the um, brain on the right, that's the psychedelic brain. And as you can see, the number of connections um, is um, so much more complex. Um, and the uh, MRI findings are that um, the, a lot of the cortex is lit up and, and lit up in these new and interesting ways. Um, but it's not random. And I would suggest that we really, we know what this day is like. Um, there's those moments like um, getting to a mountain peak or um, uh, one of those high mountain lakes where um, it just feels like, um, I don't know, we're part of something bigger. Um, or, I don't know, for me, sometimes just sitting at my kitchen table on a Sunday morning and not thinking about anything, or um, waking up next to somebody that we love and just being overtaken by that feeling, um, or there's those songs or that work of art that just makes us feel like something, um, part of something bigger. Um, I, I don't think there's any studies um, showing that those things correlate. Um, but um, for me, the experience is similar. Um, and if you want more information on complex brain, and I'm going to talk about this a lot more later, uh, but Robin Carr Harris and Anil Seth are good references. Another way our default mode is deactivated um, is uh, in addiction and trauma. And in addiction and trauma, uh, what you see is that instead of this more complex um, interconnected uh, cortex um, uh, picture, what you see is, um, is that these very primitive parts of the brain start to take over. Um, all of the um, connections from our medial prefrontal cortex to our amygdala are weakened or lost. And amygdala is about uh, remembering highly salient emotional events. Um, and um, it's very closely connected to the autonomic nervous system and to our motivation centers um, through our nucleus accumbens. So um, about a third of the amygdala is dedicated towards positive experience and about two thirds towards negative experience. Um, so in a way, I think about addiction and trauma as being um, running on our amygdala. Um, and in addiction, it's more about seeking positive experience and in trauma about avoiding negative experience. Um, and uh, of course, addiction and trauma often coexist. Uh, this is the brain of, uh, well, the one on the left is um, the brain of somebody who's um, not um, addicted. Um, and the one in the middle shows what the brain looks like um, uh, on cocaine. And um, as you can see, most of the cortex is not lit up. Um, I think this area um, down at the bottom of that um, scan might be the posterior cingulate gyrus. That's 
that sense of self thing that's still going. Um, and as you can see, even 100 days um, of sobriety, um, the brain's still not back to normal. It looks like uh, studies show that it takes almost a year for our brain to come back to normal, and sometimes two years. Uh, this is kind of a cartoon drawing of networks involved in trauma. And as you can see, the one on the lower right is um, the default mode and uh, decreased connectivity there. Um, if you want more research on the brain and addiction, look for the work of Nora Volkov. And uh, for more research on the brain and trauma, Ruth Linnaeus, those are good resources. So how do I think about this? Well, I think of uh, three ways of being. Um, so there's sort of the addiction trauma mode, there's the default mode network, and then there's complex brain. Um, different fields describe this in different ways. Um, so in the psychology world, they might talk about um, addiction and trauma versus neurosis. Uh, as, as default mode is sort of the source of neurosis and uh, complex brain as being more like primary process. Um, spirituality might talk about addiction and trauma versus ego versus enlightenment. The rationalist view might be addiction and trauma, and then there's what's real, and then there's what's, uh, what's just nonsense. There's a, um, another diagram of this. It's like an um, upside down pyramid where at the bottom addiction and trauma is a very primitive part of the brain. Um, it's rigid, it's closed to new experience, um, and a very simple circuit to diagram. And then at the very top is uh, more flexible, more open to new experience, and more complex. And as you can see, um, there are very dense addictions and traumas um, and more open ones. And then you can see there's um, very um, closed and rigid um, default mode networks and open ones, and the same with um, complex brain. Um, my experience is that we sort of fluctuate between all of these, um, but we tend to sort of define ourselves by one. We sort of um, ignore any feelings of being one um, with uh, and being um, not separate, being a part of things. Um, and uh, we might tend to ignore addictive stuff or um, um, or traumatic stuff and say, no, this is who I am. Um, by the way, um, I have a, a complete brain-based model of the self. Um, and in that, <coughs> excuse me, in that model, um, I bring in the, um, what we know about the, um, the left brain uh, has a um, certain, certain perspective on the world and the right brain has its own perspective. So I bring in those two, what we know about those uh, different perspectives, add it to those three ways of being, and it comes up with a two by three chart. And then I use zeros to sort of um, define each one of those six segments. And I've given you this, the, those slides at the end of this. So if you have any interest, you're welcome to look at those. Um, I don't really have time to go into it. And besides, I think that's getting pretty far afield from our subject. Um, so more about this complex brain. Um, um, so when you ask people about what the psychedelic experience is, um, what they will say is there's dissolution of the self, there's perceptual changes, and like I said before, it's not just external it's perceptual changes like hallucinations, but it's also we um, our internal um, perceptions change. And then there's this thing called the mystical experience, um, or it looks like this. Um, so um, what we found in all of these studies that we've done on treating mental health disorders with psychedelics is that the level of improvement correlates with this intensity of the mystical experience and the intensity of ego dissolution. Um, so this um, mystical experience looks up to be important for um, health. Um, and uh, what we use most often to measure the uh, mystical experience is something called the mystical experience questionnaire. This was developed by Walter Pankey. Uh, Walter Pankey is the guy who did the Good Friday experiment back in the 60s where he 
um, um, had um, seminary students volunteer to come into church and get either uh, psilocybin or niacin. And then he followed the two groups to see what happened and found that more of the people that had a, um, uh, a mystical experience at church um, stayed in the clergy than ones that didn't. Um, and there are some interesting stories around this. So if you're um, interested, um, you should check that out. Uh, Walter Pankey's uh, work was actually based on uh, Walter Terrence Stace's work. Um, he was a philosopher and he was the first one to sort of create an epistemology of mystical states. Uh, the mystical experience questionnaire can be divided into these four factors. There's sacredness, positive mood, there's transcendence of time and space, and if ineffability. Ineffability means um, um, I can't put this to words. Um, and sacredness includes um, experiences of unity, of being a uh, part of everything part of the universe or just a part of mankind or a part of, um, of the biosphere. Um, emptiness um, is often described as a full emptiness. Um, it's um, like our normal sense of uh, what's solid and real isn't real, but there's something there and people often describe that something as God or love, um, these kinds of things. And then there's noetic qualities. Um, there is this feeling that this experience is really important, um, that um, um, that um, I've learned something special here, that um, it's very significant. And people describe it as euphoric, feeling one with the universe and everything, um, this compassion and emptiness and beyond words. Um, this dropping away of our usual sense of self can also be terrifying and we know this because uh, well one of the reasons um that hallucinogens were outlawed was that the um, the cia um and the military um put lsd in a bunch of gi's coffee um and without telling them and they freaked out um but in studies it's often these kind of terrifying experiences that uh, people say are the most life-changing they will say things like, this is one of the most significant um, experiences of my life. And um, at the same time say, I'm not sure I ever want to do that again. Um, so the famous bad trip um, is for me, it's usually, I define it by anxiety. So it's not just having a negative experience, it's how the negative experience is framed. And so, um, um, it's the anxiety around the experience, the fear of it, that um, that really uh, leads to the bad trip. And so therapists do a lot before, during, and after a, um, uh, a psychedelic experience um, to alleviate anxiety. Um, by the way, um, this dissolution of the default mode and onset of um, complex brain, um, that's only temporary. Um, people, go back into default mode the next day. Um, but the subtext seems much different. Uh, complex brains sort of give us a chance to look back on our default mode sub subtext and not see them so, uh, take them so seriously, see them in a different light. And then even months after a psychedelic experience, people talk about having more meaning and purpose in their lives, uh, more feelings of closeness to the people they love, uh, less separateness, uh, more connection to the world. Um, it's not just psychedelics um, that create complex brain. Uh, Long-term meditators, these guys who spend their entire life meditating, they're always in complex brains, like their default mode doesn't even exist. Um, there's a spontaneous mystical experience, um, like I was talking about these, you know, coming to a mountaintop or um, people have these religious experiences. Uh, of course, it's really hard to scan somebody's brain during those times. And then there's um, children. Children, um, um, their brains aren't in default mode. It takes a while for the default mode to develop. And um, there's some people out there in the literature who say that um, because there's these similarities between a child's brain and uh, the brain of these um, uh, long-term meditators, um, that um, they're the same. Um, but there's differences, um, and I think it's pretty obvious. If we look at the Dalai Lama, he really 
doesn't look like a four-year-old. This, um, like I said, this default mode takes a while to develop. We actually myelinate our brain starting from, and this happens um, after birth, um, starting from the back of our brain to the front and also from the midline outwards. Um, so it takes a while for that to myelinate. And then um, until age of six, our brains are just growing like crazy. There's just um, all of these neuronal connections going on. Um, and then from about six to 18, there's this pruning process that takes place. Um, so it's not until um, we're 18 and then that pruning process starts in the back and goes to the front. So it's really the, the front part of our brain where that front part of the uh, default mode lies. It's not really through wiring until, um, until we're 18. Um, I, I find this, this psychoanalytic correlate of uh, complex brain really interesting. Um, Winnicott, who um, is a child psychoanalyst, was a child psychoanalyst um, in Britain, um, sort of early in his career in this paper called The Capacity to Be Alone, talked about this concept uh, he called the unintegration. Um, and uh, he kept coming back to this concept over and over. And the idea is that a child um, who's um, just alone playing but is safe, so uh, he might be in his room, mom's in the kitchen, that his um, psyche will go from a place of things uh, being integrated, of, of being coherent, things sort of make sense, to this place where things just sort of there's no sense to it. There's no, um, things aren't integrated. Um, they're sort of open. And then back to being integrated in a new way. Um, and um, this is how people grow. Um, they go from this integrated place to an unintegrated place to being integrated in a new way. And um, another thing he said was that kids who um, don't have a sense of safety, instead of their brains when they're, um, um, when things don't make sense going into an unintegrated place, they go into a disintegrated place, which is chaotic, anxious, anxiety producing, um, and scary. Um, and so we'll often want to maintain some sense of integration. But I'm thinking maybe this thing Winnicott was talking about was going into complex brain. Um, so how would we use a drug that um, alters self in this way? So um, it turns out that um, you really have to pay a lot of attention to set and setting. Um, in a way, set and setting is all about therapeutic alliance. And we know that therapeutic alliance matters in healthcare. Um, it matters in surgery. It matters in internal medicine. Um, there's studies a uh, patient trusts his internist that he's more likely to have a positive response from um, antihypertensives and such. Um, and we know um, it's very significant in um, psychotherapy. Um, but here in addiction, it's really important. Um, so what is set? Set is um, giving people an idea of what might ha happen during the psychedelic experience. So there's this uh, pre-drug instructions, um, but also it's a beginning of that therapeutic alliance. Um, and so the session, it's important that all the, um, the instructions beforehand um, are uh, with the same therapist as the ones that you have during the psychedelic experience and also in the um, uh, post-psychedelic uh, integration of the um, experience. These instructions are very vague. There are things like um, your psyche will show you what you need to see. Um, things like um, uh, just go with the experience. Um, and if you have a negative experience, face it. Um, it'll pass. Um, we'll be right there with you. Ask yourself, uh, why is this coming up right now? These instructions aren't things like uh, focus on your PTSD or focus on your cancer or on happiness or on your depression or whatever. Um, and during the session, therapists don't try to manipulate the experience. They're there for support um, and protection. Um, with true psychedelics, um, 
um, the experience is mostly internal. Um, with uh, MDMA, the experience is um, allows more external um, uh, contact. So um, with MDMA, the um, um, the therapist can be more involved in the um, in the um, treatment. The um, the setting, it's a living room-like atmosphere. It's not a hospital room. Um, there's living room-like lighting lamps, uh, not uh, industrial lighting. Um, there's a soft couch to lay on, blankets, pillows, um, um, art on the wall, um, stuff like that. Um, all the um, pre-psychedelic experience uh, sessions and the post-psychedelic sessions are all in the same place to create more of a sense of safety. Um, and people are provided with an eye mask and headphones. Um, so during the psychedelic experience, people will listen to music. Um, and um, um, there's therapists who are very invested in what um, in their music because they've found it to be uh, effective in the past. Um, and um, um, and then there's um, some input from patients as well. It's often a um, a, uh, um, a discussion about people what people are going to listen to. Um, but it's usually stuff like ambient music, like Brian Eno or classical music. Um, I'll say one note about microdosing. Um, what microdosing is is people take like um, a thirtieth to a, a tenth of a normal dose. So it's not a psychedelic experience um, and do it maybe two or three times a week. Um, there's not much research on this. I really doubt that FDA is going to approve research on microdosing. Um, they don't want these drugs out there in the public. Um, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. Um, people say that um, these have been helpful for anxiety and depression. Um, so what are these drugs? Um, there's the entheogens. These are the true psychedelics. There's the enactogens. Um, these are like MDMA or um, kind of a moderate dose of ketamine. Um, entheogen means, um, um, sorry, I got a little interruption here. Um, entheogens means uh, becoming divine within um, and enactogen means uh, touching within. I mean, there's ketamine and ibogaine. Um, you guys can probably come up with some more, but these are the ones I'm going to talk about. What are the true psychedelics? Um, the entheogens. There's LSD, um, psilocybin, mescaline, DMT, and there's probably more. Um, LSD is synthetic. It was first synthesized by Albert Hoffman in 1938. Um, he um, tried it in animals, saw that it didn't do anything, and just put it on the shelf. Um, he wonders why he put it on the shelf instead of throwing it away, which is what uh, he usually did with drugs that didn't show any promise. Um, so five years later, uh, on April 16th, um, he took it off the shelf and accidentally ing ingested some. Then he had to ride his bicycle home. And his description of that bicycle ride um, on the, um, the first acid trip um, is um, something else. And nowadays, uh, LSD enthusiasts celebrate uh, Bicycle Day on April 16th every year. Um, with psilocybin and mescaline, there are synthetic versions, um, but psilocybin occurs naturally in psilocybin mushrooms, and mescaline comes from the peyote cactus. This is a picture of psilocybin mushrooms. Um, there's evidence that prehistoric man used psilocybin. And Paul Stamets, who is a mycologist and uh, the world expert on psilocybin, says that there's also evidence that non-human primates will intentionally seek out psilocybin and, um, and eat it. Uh, this is peyote. Uh, and peyote buttons have been found in caves suggesting use by humans um, over 5,700 years ago. Uh, DMT is found in the leaves of the Secretaria viridis plant. Um, the problem with DMT is that if you ingest it orally, that it's immediately degraded in the gut by monoamine oxidase. And so you have to um, inhibit the monoamine oxidase 
uh, by taking something else. And it turns out that um, there's monoamine oxidase inhibitors in Banisteriopsis capi. Um, and so mixing these two into a tea, you come up with ayahuasca. And this is the Sacatria of Iridis. And this is uh, Banisteriopsis capi. So what do these do? Um, well, they stimulate 5-HT2A receptors. And we know this is the active component um, because if you block 5-HT2A um, people and then give somebody a psychedelic, uh, they do not have a psychedelic experience. Um, there are differences between these four um, true psychedelics. Um, LSD also stimulates dopamine receptors. Psilocybin stimulates 5-HT1A and 5-HT2C. Uh, DMT avidly binds to 5-HT1A. And experienced users will tell you that the experience of different drugs um, is, is different. Um, the half-lives and times to onset are different as well. Um, DMT, if you inject, it has a very short half-life, but when you take it as um, ayahuasca, um, it's about an hour and a half to onset and uh, last up to six hours. Um, the pharmacokinetics of LSD are pretty complex, but it kicks in about an hour and a half and lasts up to 12 hours. Psilocybin, it kicks in anywhere from 10 to 40 minutes, lasts six hours. Uh, mescaline um, uh, lasts up to six to 12 hours. Um, side effects include bad trips um, that I talked about. There's flashbacks, um, and we don't know a lot about these. Um, in the literature, they talk about flashbacks flashbacks as HPPD, um, and um, I hate this term, uh, it's really hard to say, hallucination persisting perception disorder, um, and then there's a uh, dangerous behavior. Um, but they have very low uh, addictive potential, uh, for one thing, for the most part when people use a psychedelic, they don't want to use the next day. Um, they want to they wanna take a few days off and process. Um, and the other problem is that if you do take it every day, um, tolerance develops pretty quickly. Uh, there is a lot of hype and fear about um, uh, permanent brain damage back in the 70s, but that's not true. Um, like I said, we don't know a lot about HPPD flashbacks. Um, what it usually is just like um, uh, a weird visual phenomenon like streaks and flashes of light and dots of light. Um, and um, most cases um, are just that, that those little flashes last for a few weeks. Um, there's some episodes of chronic um, HPPD. Uh, the estimates are maybe one in 50,000. Um, and then there are these kind of true flashbacks so we don't know much about where people actually have a, uh, a full-blown psychedelic experience. Um, those seem to be extremely rare. Um, as I said before, in studies, bad trips are rare because uh, we do a lot to um, alleviate anxiety. And in um, the studies at Johns Hopkins and NYU, um, there were none. Remember that part of the instruction is to uh, move towards negative experience and ask yourself what it's trying to do for you. Um, and then these experiences of people running into traffic or jumping off bridges, um, they don't really um, happen as if you've got a lot of people around to. Um, uh, make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, what about the impathogens? Um, this is uh, mostly MDMA. Um, MDMA is 3,4-methylene dioxymethamphetamine. It's not um, it's not considered to be a true psychedelic because it doesn't lead to complex brain. Um, it works on serotonin receptors. It works on the serotonin transporter, just like SSRIs do. Um, but instead of just sort of blocking the uptake of serotonin, it causes the transporters to just pour out serotonin like crazy. Um, and, um, MDMA has some effects on dopamine and norepinephrine, and it also increases oxytocin levels. Um, the brain effects are things like um, you see reduced limbic system activity. There's more uh, communication between the medial pre uh, temporal cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, I mean, less, um, and um, there is an increased communication between the hippocampus and the amygdala, and I find that finding really interesting because uh, a lot of the trauma research shows that there's decreased connection between hippocampus and amygdala. 
onset of MDMA about a, a half hour to three hours, half life is six to eight hours, and the brain serotonin uh, levels return to normal after a day or two. Uh, subjectively, people talk about increased empathy, um, more closeness to others, euphoria, less anxiety, increased emotionality, uh, increased communication with others, increased sexuality, increased self-acceptance. Um, self-acceptance, I think, is important uh, in treatment. And then side effects, it sort of um, transiently increases blood pressure and pulse rate, uh, rarely to any significant um, extent. Um, I, I could almost say never, um, unless you have underlying um, blood pressure and pulse problems. Um, and then um, after the use, um, the day after, people sometimes crash. Um, they'll have fatigue, depression, and um, decreased ability to think. And then um, there are some people, um, and this is also pretty rare, um, that um, if they use every day for a long period of time, uh, will develop um, what looks like um, some neurotoxicity. And the thought is that if you don't give your serotonin neurons a chance to rebuild serotonin and you keep pounding them, that uh, eventually they might, um, they might die. Um, MDMA has slightly more addictive potential than LSD, but it's extremely safe. Um, in a study in the UK, it was the 18th um, uh, out of 20 um, recreational drugs um, in level of um, harmfulness. In other words, it was the least harmful, almost the least. Uh, what about ketamine? Um, ketamine is an interesting drug. Um, it's, uh, it's used in four ways. One is the medical model where people um, are diagnosed with depression. Um, they go in and get their uh, dose of ketamine um, and they go home and there's no real attention to set and setting. Um, another is at sort of moderate levels. Um, you can use it like MDMA and then at high doses you can use it like, um, like you might use LSD or psilocybin. And then there are some people who will um, sort of need a low to moderate dose um, periodically, um, like every three months, um, to keep their depression at bay. It is an antagonist at NMDA uh, glutamate receptors, um, has a lot of other actions as well. It was first developed as an anesthetic because it um, um, uh, reduces pain, um, causes sedation, and causes memory loss. Mostly use IV or IM. Um, S-ketamine, which was recently approved by the FDA, is intranasal, um, and then there are oral forms. Um, part of the problem with oral is that it's not absorbed very well. So often it will be given as a, uh, in a lozenge form, so it can be absorbed sublingually. Um, so its onset IV, IM, and intranasally is quite rapid and it lasts about two hours, or really it can last up to four hours. Um, it has some effects on uh, blood pressure and pulse rate as well. Dizziness and anxiety are uh, fairly common immediate effects as well. Um, it does have some addictive uh, potential. Um, the most famous case of addiction was uh, John Lilly, the psychiatrist uh, in Venture. Um, Ibogaine, I don't know a lot about this drug, um, but they're using it for treatment of heroin abuse. Um, most of these studies come out of Mexico and New Zealand. Um, it comes from the bark of the West African plant, uh, Iboga or Iboga. Um, it's used as a hallucinogen. I mean, it's classified as a hallucinogen in the United States and illegal. Um, the pharmacodynamic effects are not real clear, but it looks like it has effects on serotonin receptors, NMDA receptors, and um, probably on opiate receptors as well. Um, it has two phases. There's this kind of hallucinatory phase that lasts uh, four to six hours, and then an introspective stay, uh, phase that lasts for 24 hours. And there's some worry about cardiotoxicity, um, more specifically that our um, QT intervals are uh, prolonged. So I will talk about the uh, clinical research next, but if there's any questions out there, um, I'm open. Uh, let's see. Um, 
So one person asked about the um, use of MDMA in couples work. Um, and I was going to mention that later. I will mention it later. Um, and um, how a clinician might have the opportunity to legally and ethically explore this work. Um, what I would recommend is the, the um, work on couples is being sponsored by MAPS, uh, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Um, you can go to maps.org. Um, and um, there's a lot of uh, resources there on how to become a uh, MDMA therapist. Um, have there been any studies using psychedelics with OCD and what are the outcomes? Um, I've heard that there are ongoing studies. Um, I'm really interested in that as well. Um, there were studies from the um, 40s to 70s on OCD, but they weren't on OCD specifically. Um, so uh, we really don't know outcomes yet. Um, and I'll talk that, about that stuff when I talk about the clinical research. Um, can psychedelics permanently change or improve DMN, uh, default mode network? Um, um, maybe. Um, to me, um, um, I, I don't know of any research on people who have claimed um, to um, have like permanently uh, disrupted their default mode and looking at them. Um, there is um, one famous person, his name is Junpo Roshi. Um, and I forget what his name was before he was Junpo Roshi, but he was the guy who invented window pane LSD. And now he's a meditation teacher. Um, and, um, but what he did was he did a lot of meditating. Um, so not only did he do a lot of acid, he did a lot of meditating. Um, I'm guessing his brain is um, mostly in complex brain. Um, can repeated use lead to complex brain? I think it sort of depends on what you do in between. Um, and can they replace the use of ECT in a clinical setting? Um, I hope so. Um, I don't know of any sort of head-to-head -head studies looking at uh, ECT um, uh, versus uh, psychedelics. Um, but one thing is um, with ECT is that um, ECT is useful in uh, people with psychosis um, and um, um, bipolar disorder. I'm checking myself here. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I, I know it's useful for catatonic um, psychosis. Um, I'm not sure about bipolar, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, um, and um, uh, psychedelics are contraindicated in those uh, disorders. Um, okay. Um, someone asked for more about Winnicott unintegration. Um, um, so um, clinically, um, the way I think about that is that um, change is difficult. Um, that especially for people who weren't safe, um, that any sort of letting go of a coherent way of being of uh, something that's integrated um, is difficult. Um, and so that move from going from an integrated way of being into an unintegrated, um, if for people that move has been going from integrated to disintegrated, um, that's a pretty scary move, which makes change difficult. Um, I, I don't know what else I could say about it. Um, maybe if you have anything more specific, uh, you could ask me, uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, number of sessions recommended. Um, so I'll talk about that a bit um, when I talk about the clinical research. Um, someone asked about um, the spontaneous mystical experience. Um, and um, we don't know a lot about this. Um, what I know from meditation teachers is that um, there's this idea out there that there are some people who have these uh, amazing spontaneous um, 
um, mystical experiences and others that it's sort of a um, that mystical experience complex brain is sort of an asymptote that they sort of gradually have more and more experience with it with time um, and there is a question about the impact of light causing mystical experience um, and we don't know much about this either. There is uh, interesting research. Um, this came out of uh, mice research um, where they raised mice with um, these um, um, uh, neurons that were very, um, uh, somehow had um, light receptors in them. And then they implanted lasers into the brains of these mice and flashlights and um, the, in the neurons to see what would happen and actually somehow came up with the notion that they could um, uh, prevent Alzheimer's disease uh, with lights and um, um, but then they found out they didn't have to do this um, they could actually just flash lights in the mice's eyes so they created these table these light tables and they would put mice in a dark room and flash I think it was blue light at them at a certain frequency and uh, prevented um, Alzheimer's um, Let's see. Um, if these types of treatments are not FDA approved or endorsed by insurance companies, how can licensed clinicians recommend it without violating state regulations? You can't. Um, let's see. Um, I have patients bring it up though. Um, and what I tell them is um, there's ongoing research um and um they might qualify for studies uh, let's see are there any therapeutic modalities that are especially helpful with clients under the influence of psychedelics um i specialize in internal family systems for example it would uh it seems like it would pair up so well so for the most part, um, um, and this is almost impossible, um, with a psychedelic experience, it's so internal um, that you wouldn't be um, using any therapeutic uh, modality. Um, there's more opportunity to use whatever um, theoretical um, standpoint you come from with uh, MDMA kind of therapy. Um, but for the most part, while people are on psychedelics, um, the the um, the technique is just to let whatever comes up for people come up um, and to not interfere with that process much. And then what um, I think therapists often do is they pull in their um, their knowledge base, their um, uh, therapeutic, their theoretical um, background in the integration studies. Um, Are there ways to assess potential and negative side effects? Um, so, um, uh, not yet. I think that's coming. Um, there are what we know from studies in the 40s, 50s, 60s um, is that um, you treat people with borderline personality, with um, 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 with psychosis, and with bipolar disorder, that they get worse. Um, but that's that's how we know, and that's all we know so far. Um, many of these psychedelics mentioned are used in uh, indigenous um, ceremonies. Um, I'm curious if there's been any neurological comparison between the use of psychedelics in the therapeutic setting um, and after one of these, like uh, ayahuasca or iboga. Um, so I don't know of any neurological studies, um, um, but I know that there are more psychological studies, um, and um, um, it seems that um, it's it, there. There are similar effects. Uh, let's see. Can you explain the phenomenon of ego death? It is a is it a desired outcome for the patient? Are there risks in reaching that state? Um, so ego death is um, correlated with this dissolution of the default mode network. Um, and um, it is a desired um, outcome. It looks like the more ego dissolution there is, that the better people get. 
Um, are there risks? Um, so far in clinical studies, it looks like the risks are very low. Um, um, and um, like I said, set and setting mean everything. Um, if you're the CIA and you just put LSD in people's coffee, um, that's not a good idea. Um, could you speak a little about EMDR insights in complex brain? Um, that's a really interesting question. And um, I don't think there's any research on that. Um, um, but uh, I would love to see that. Uh, uh, that kind of research. Is there a best way to overcome a bad trip um, when you're alone um, and see people in the world uh, not really caring and, um, and that the world is not really caring to have a good trip? Uh, with LSD, um, does, does it break down mental constructs and rebuild them? So it's important to have a, a strong mind or safe, strong-minded people around. Um, so in answer to the first question, um, 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 MAPS is another great resource for that. Um, they, um, they have a whole range, a whole group of people that are um, around just to help people who are struggling um, with, uh, with bad trips. Uh, but what I would suggest is you don't do it alone. Uh, and um, that you do have um, people that are trained to um, to use these clinically. Um, I hope that answers that question. Ah, here's another interesting question. Uh, when is it a good age? Uh, uh, to start experiencing the benefit of psychedelics. Um, um, personally, I think not until 18, um, but, um, um, and, and that's because our brain is still in that process of uh, pruning. And um, I don't think we have any idea what interfering with that pruning process would be. Um, but I'm guessing um, um, at some point, somebody will study them in uh, adolescence. Uh, I certainly wouldn't give them to anybody uh, um, younger than adolescent. All right. I think I will go back and talk about the clinical research. Um, there's one more question here. Um, All right, uh, how do we help get this data in front of lawmakers so doctors and therapists have more tools to help people? Um, that is MAP's whole purpose in life. Um, and um, um, with, uh, Rich Doblin, um, who uh, started MAPS back in the 60s, he, um, uh, um, this has been his um, life ambition and, um, and he's, uh, He's um, responsible for um, helping the FDA um, uh, get more interested in these. Okay, back to clinical studies. So, um, and thanks for all the questions, guys. Um, so these, these drugs are actually pretty difficult to study from the standpoint of our usual double-blind placebo-controlled study. For one, the clinicians and um, clients, um, participants, um, both know whether they've gotten drug or not. Um, and for another, um, part of the double-blind uh, placebo-controlled um, um, study is that you take out all factors except for the medicine. Um, and um, this is something that you can't um, really do in these studies because set and setting matter so much. The therapists matter so much. Um, so there was a lot of research from 1940 to 1970. There's a great review of all the studies going back to 1895 by Rucker, Illiff, and Nutt um, that you can check out. That paper refers to a lot of research problems. Most of these research problems um, were just because um, um, clinicians back then really didn't um, 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 didn't talk to statisticians very much. 
Um, so there are things like uh, there was not statistical analysis um, that outcome measures weren't validated, uh, that there was no attempts to blind um, uh, the studies, um, and that uh, treatments were inconsistently applied. Um, power calculations weren't done. Uh, when they were first developed, um, uh, Sandoz, uh, when it first discovered LSD, said, we have a drug here that induces psychosis. Um, uh, psychomimetic is what they called it. And what they did was they just sort of gave LSD for free to all these clinicians and said, just play with it. Um, I think they were just looking for a use. Um, so a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists um, took LSD with the idea that they could have a much better understanding of what psychosis was like. Um, but when we tried giving it to people with schizophrenia, it made them worse. Uh, the study on neurotic, the studies on neurotic disorders were a little um, better um, outcomes, um, not very well done. Um, so what they often did, what it looks like they did, was they just took anybody that came into the hospital or the um, mental health clinic, um, they just said, hey, you want to take acid? <laughs> um, and um, and then they just sort of reported um, how many people got better and how many people got worse without any um, any attention to which people got better and which didn't. Um, there's one study by Savage that includes 63 psychoneurotic. Um, our terminology's changed, so I don't know what a lot of these things are. Uh, two schizophrenic reaction, 117 personality disorder, a nine sexual disorder, and I hate to think what that might have been back then. Um, 24 alcoholism and 27 adjustment disorder. And then what they reported was 46 of those guys got better, 64 um, got a, somewhat better, um, 41 didn't get better at all, um, and no reference to um, whether it mattered what kind of disorder you had, what your presenting symptoms were. Um, LSD was also um, looked at as treatment for um, alcoholism and addiction. Um, there's a lot of research out of the Weyburn Psychiatric Hospital in Saskatchewan, in Saskatchewan using LSD to treat alcoholism. My read on Weyburn back then was that a lot of the staff was using LSD, um, but they paid close attention to set and setting, um, and they also um, pulled in AA um, as part of the model. Uh, there's one study by Jensen. It showed there was a lot more abstinence in a group of 58 alcoholics versus a group of 80 controls. Um, and um, there was enough interest in using LSD um, with, in combination of, with AA that there was some consideration of having LSD part, be part of 12-step programs. Um, of course, the uh, board of AA kind of nixed that early on. Um, and there were some studies that just weren't well done like this study from SMART, which was well done from a sort of a placebo um, uh, controlled study, but um, the way they gave a LSD to people was they strapped them to a bed, gave them LSD, and then um, just closed the door. So it's no wonder they didn't have positive results. There was this uh, meta-analysis done just eight years ago. Um, they could only find six studies that they could actually include in the meta-analysis. Um, and what they found was that there's a lot more abstinence at three months versus control, but that that, uh, that finding went away at six months. Uh, there's one other study that I'll mention. It's, it's the Concord Prison Experiment. Um, and this was done by Timothy Leary. Um, he decided that um, he wanted to look at whether doing group therapy with convicts while they were under the influence of psilocybin would lead to... Um, um, felons not committing crime so much. And uh, he reported that um, there was um, a decreased recidiv recidivism in um, felons who got um, psilocybin. But when people went back and looked at that study later, it turned out it, it really wasn't true. Um, so all in all, um, the studies from then were a bit of a mess. Um, but there is enough evidence for efficacy to warrant further treatment. Um, it's taken a while to get um, the FDA to um, agree with this. Um, and um, But there were some people who um, were so invested in this treatment because they saw such great results that um, they 
have been willing to um, risk the legal ramifications and continue offer treatment, the um, psychedelic treatment underground. It's out there somewhere. Um, but what's what? What are we doing today? Um, so there's been this resurgence of research, um, and I'll just present a few examples. Um, I think one of the things that makes this research um, um, more palatable is that um, we have a lot more um, notion of how statistics work, and I think also um, having brain studies is very useful. This says uh, the human body is 90% water, so basically we're just anxious cucumbers. Um, so the exclusion criteria for all these studies is the same. So um, psychotic disorders, immediate family history of psychotic disorder, uh, bipolar disorder, a history of psychosis is uh, um, maybe, um, but for the most part, a borderline personality disorder, significant medical problems, unless you're studying people that have significant significant medical problems. Um, and then there's active substance dependence, uh, um, unless you're um, um, studying substance dependence. Uh, in the MDMA um, study, the um, people were asked to have been abstinent for at least six months. Um, and the adverse effects in the studies were similar to what I talked about um, when I talked about the individual drugs. There's uh, mild elevation, heart rate, blood pressure, dizziness, anxiety, um, mostly um, in the first few minutes after onset of drugs. Um, the, uh, the dropout rates uh, in these studies have been incredibly low. You have to take people off their psychiatric medications, um, especially serotonergic medications, and that's for obvious reasons. So I'm going to talk about one MDMA study and five psilocybin studies. Um, the study using MDMA to um, uh, treat PTSD is near and dear to my heart. Uh, one, because uh, I was uh, involved in the others, just because um, I treat a lot of complex PTSD, um, and uh, it just does not seem to respond um, to um, 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 our standard uh, antidepressants and such very well. Um, this study was uh, has been sponsored by the uh, by MAPS that I mentioned before, and they concluded phase two trials, which is what I will talk about. Uh, they concluded those last year. Um, so there were 105 patients from six study sites. Hmm. Including one in Boulder. There are sites in Canada, Switzerland, and Israel. Only eight people dropped out. Uh, participants were largely white and well-educated. I think we're looking into what to do about that. Um, so inclusion criteria mean that you had to have a CAP score above 50. So people had really bad PTSD. Um, and the way they did it was about a third of people got placebo, which was just a, um, a smaller dose of MDMA. Um, and then the others got a high dose and there were two sessions. Um, and there were um, two or three 90-minute sessions beforehand um, and um, uh, to sort of uh, create the therapeutic alliance. Um, and then after each session, there were two or three integrating sessions. Um, and then there were also daily phone calls um, after each session. Um, um, all sessions were with the same two providers, one male, one female. Um, sessions lasted eight hours, and the participant um, had to spend the night in the treatment room um, with a um, sitter um, in a room nearby. And I think they did that because uh, they were worried a lot of these people um, um, had a lot of suicidality before entrance into the study, um, and they were worried about that kind of post-drug crash. Um, but it turned out it, that wasn't much of a problem. And in fact, I think uh, suicidality decreased during the study. The sessions were uh, three to five weeks apart. And after these two sessions, uh, what they showed is that the, um, the CAP scores dropped by 30 points uh, in the treatment group uh, versus only 10 in the control group. That meant 54% of people no longer met criteria for PTSD after two doses of MDMA. Uh, this is incredible. And the effect size, uh, the effect size was quite high, um, 0.8. The number needed to treat was two. 
Um, in other words, um, if you treat um, two people, um, one is likely to go into remission. I don't know of any other medications that I prescribe that um, show this. Uh, for example, um, I think the um, the number needed to treat for SSRIs and depression is more like eight. Um, that only one out of eight will actually go into remission. Um, then what they did was they gave uh, people that had the high dose um, um, uh, MDMA, they gave them another session. Um, and what they showed was that after that session, the drop in CAP scores was 45, so even more. Um, and then um, just for compassionate reasons, they also gave the low dose patients the option of having um, sessions with a higher dose. Um, but none of those data were included in the uh, data were included in the um, statistical analysis. There were also secondary measures of depression that showed improvement. Um, this is one of my favorite findings. Um, um, at six to nine months, when they went back and asked people how they were doing, um, people showed additional improvement. Um, so not only were they better at the end of the study, um, but six or nine months, they were even better. Um, and the idea is that there's something about this treatment that teaches people how to deal with their um, uh, PTSD. And, um, um, and so they continue treating themselves after the study is over. Um, because of these phase two results, phase three was approved by the FDA and that began uh, this year. Um, there's some hope that the FDA might grant uh, compassionate use um, by even next month. And um, MAPS is hoping for FDA approval by mid-2022. Um, just as a comparison, SSRIs and PTSD, um, I think the best remission rates I've seen, it depends on whether you're looking at complex PTSD, uh, combat, veteran, combat veterans, or, um, um, or um, uh, um, civilian. Um, trauma, um, that the remission rates are quite low, um, like uh, more like 30%. And the dropout rate in these studies is incredible. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. And then the effect sizes are much lower. In addition, um, it looks like if you treat PTSD um, with medication and people get better, that uh, the symptoms come back if you stop their meds. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, the meds that we use to treat PTSD um, cause a lot of side effects. So there are a couple studies on end of life anxiety and depression. Um, there were uh, two studies that were published in the same journal um, in 2016. Uh, there's one by Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins and another by um, um, Stephen Ross at NYU. Um, they used um, similar protocols and showed similar results. Um, uh, Griffith's study um, looked at 51 patients and um, the placebo arm was a uh, low dose of psilocybin. Ross's study had 29 patients um, and his placebo was high dose. And it was a crossover design where people either got um, psilocybin first and then placebo or vice versa. Um, all these patients had cancer and the vast majority had either recurrent or metastatic disease and patients had moderate to severe um, anxiety and depression. Um, again, um, participants were largely white and well-educated. Um, usual exclusion criteria, um, a lot of these people had done psychedelics before, but by nowhere, uh, no means all. And there were five to seven weeks between sessions, and they followed these guys out to six months. Um, again, a lot of uh, attention to set and setting. Um, and the instruction was just pay attention to your inner experience and nothing about um, attitude uh, towards cancer. And they measured everything. I can't believe the number of studies they did. Um, there's a few measures of depression and a few measures of anxiety, some quality of life measures, measures of spirituality and faith, measures of purpose, measures of a transcendence of death. Um, they showed that 80% um, of clients um, showed a response and over 60% uh, remission of their anxiety and depression that, uh, that continued for up to six months. And that was compared to about 20% uh, in the placebo group. 
um, and the effect size was one um, compared to um, other studies um, using Prozac to treat the same thing, uh, which was uh, about 0.3. Uh, there were very few withdrawals, and most people withdrew because they um, they were just too sick to participate. Um, quality of life and spirituality increased as well. Um, and as I was talking about before, the level of improvement looked like it correlated with the depth of the psychedelic experience. Um, these other measures, 65% uh, of people, um, this is an interesting thing that Rolling Griffiths did. He asked people at the end of the study, he said, um, so how does this how does this rank among the events in your life? And 65%, so two thirds of people said that this uh, being in the study ranked right up there with uh, getting married, having children, graduating college, um, that sort of thing. 70% uh, noted uh, a spiritual significance. Uh, Michael Pollan in his book, uh, How to Change Your Mind, he interviewed one client who said she was an atheist before the study and an atheist afterwards, but um, when people ask her about the experience, the only word she has is describing it as uh, being in the hands of God. 80% um, of participants report um, increase in uh, well-being and life satisfaction. And even six months later, people reported more meaning and purpose, uh, feeling closer to the people they love, more connectedness, less separateness. Um, what about studies on alcoholism? Um, there was a study recently out of the um, University of New Mexico uh, done by Dr. Bogenschutz. Uh, this was a feasibility study. It was not a, a randomized study. Uh, it was just to see if it would be worthwhile studying this further. Um, the patient population was much more diverse. Um, all had a long history of heavy drinking. Um, what he did was he um, gave people sort of standard treatment for four weeks. Um, and then um, um, gave them psilocybin, gave them more standard treatment for four weeks, and then gave you psilocybin again. And then he compared um, how people did with respect to their alcohol um, um, after the psilocybin doses and uh, to um, how they were doing before. And he followed people for out to 34 weeks, so that's like uh, almost nine months. Um, one interesting finding was that on the mystical experience questionnaire, there was a much wider range of um, the intensity of the mystical experience um, than in a lot of the other psilocybin studies looking at different, uh, different disorders. Um, and this was found uh, back in the 60s as well, um, where it looked like alcoholics required a higher dose of LSD or psilocybin than people from other disorders. Um, and um, I was thinking about this, and um, um, what I was thinking of is that, remember that picture I showed you of the, um, the brain um, of, uh, in addiction and how little of the brain is lit up? Um, I was thinking that you need a lot of that brain to be active, to be in complex brain. So maybe it just takes more, more push for people that are um, in addiction. Um, so anyway, um, the percentage of total drinking days dropped from 42% to 15%. Um, uh, the 42 being after psilocybin 15 um, in that uh, treatment period before. And the number of heavy drinking days from 35% to 10%. And um, they remained at uh, 36 weeks. Um, what about depression? By the way, um, the FDA was um, so impressed with the um, end of life anxiety and depression studies um, that they, um, they are really pushing for more studies on uh, major depression. Um, so Robin Carr Harris, um, who I mentioned before at the Imperial College of London, he did a feasibility study on using psilocybin to treat depression. Um, he enrolled 12 patients with moderate to severe um, disease and they had to have failed um, at least two antidepressants. Uh, 11 of the 12 had also failed psychotherapy. Um, again, most were white and well-educated. Um, participants got two doses. Um, uh, they got a low dose and then a week later a high dose. And then the uh, initial studies were done well one week after the high dose. 
and that shows what happened. Um, so you can see that um, um, seven out of the 12, um, their depression went into complete remission. And um, four of those seven, no, it's eight, um, I'm sorry, eight, eight of the 12. And, and then um, uh, for those, the um, depression came back, um, but um, to, for the most part, not to near the degree that um, uh, of depression they had beforehand. Um, this translates to 67% responders and 58% rem remission after um, the week after. Um, there's only one patient who showed no response. Um, and at three months, it was 58% response and 42% remission. Um, that's pretty incredible. The STAR-D study, um, which um, it's uh, done, what, about eight years ago? Uh, no, it was longer than that. A long time ago. Um, somewhere in the 2000s, though. Um, um, showed that um, even with the best standard of care, um, that there was uh, only two-thirds remission, and that was on four drugs um, using um, standard um, antidepressants. Um, later, Robin Carr Harris added eight more patients and then looked um, at six months. The results of six months were similar to the three-month results. Um, Michael Pollan interviewed some of these guys as well. Um, and people said things for the first time in years. Um, and then those people whose depression came back, they thought, you know, maybe a periodic refresher session, uh, they, uh, they could live without depression. And again, the level of improvement correlated with uh, the level of mystical experience. Um, there's also been a study on smoking cessation and um, giving all the damage that cigarettes do. Um, this is an important study. Um, this was also a feasibility study, um, similar exclusion criteria. Um, these patients also got CBT for smoking cessation, mindfulness training, guiding imagery, um, which is um, kind of the best we can do, um, except for drugs like um, Chantix. Um, and the average rate of smoking was a pack per day for 31 years. There were 15 people enrolled. Um, they didn't just trust people to tell them what was going on. They also um, did um, um, chemical analyses. Um, so 10% of, I mean, 10 participants out of the 15 at a year uh, were confirmed abstinent by um, urine tests for nicotine. Um, and seven of those people said they hadn't smoked since the, um, the study um, a year before. Um, so that translates into about a 60% abstinent rate, um, and which compares to about 30% in our usual standard of care. And again, these results correlated with the uh, mystical experience. What about ketamine? Um, so S-ketamine um, was recently approved by the FDA uh, for severe treatment-resistant depression, um, and also even more recently um, uh, approved for depression with uh, acute suicidal ideation. Um, so these studies use the standard medical model um, that people are diagnosed with their depression, um, the uh, ketamine is prescribed, uh, they um, go to their physician's office to get the ketamine and then they go home and no, no attention to set and setting. Um, the, um, uh, the protocol is um, that you have two sessions a week for the first month, and then you have a session a week um, for maintenance, or a session every other week. Um, the positives are that um, it showed um, improvement in people who failed multiple other treatments, and it looks like the uh, response is much more rapid than you see with standard antidepressants. Um, this says, um, uh, by the way, those patients were followed out to 80 days for about um, two, and, um, two and a half months. This says, try to find something that works like aspirin, but costs a lot more. Um, the estimated cost of uh, S-ketamine is from um, uh, $1,200 to $2,700 uh, per session, and that doesn't include doctor's fees and facility fees. Um, so you're running up around, what, um, if you say $2,000, 
um, it'd be like 16,000 for the first month and then 8,000 for every month thereafter. Um, the ketamine psychotherapy, um, psychedelic uh, dosing, um, so using ketamine like you would MDMA or like you would uh, psilocybin is not as well studied. Um, there are a few promising studies looking at ketamine to, um, um, as a true psychedelic to treat heroin and alcohol abuse. Uh, there was one study, um, it wasn't done in the U.S., um, that looked at um, heroin um, and using uh, psychedelic doses of ketamine um, and showed abstinence um, at uh, two years um, uh, using a proper set and setting um, over people who did not, uh, who um, got a low dose of ketamine. Um, there's ongoing studies on depression, alcoholism, cocaine abuse, uh, eating disorders, social anxiety in uh, patients with autism, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, OCD. Um, and then Roland Griffiths is looking at the effects of psychedelics on uh, religious leaders. It'll be interesting to see what, what he finds. And then um, we talked about this earlier. Um, MAPS is sponsoring studies using MDMA to enhance couples therapy. Um, and uh, preliminary results there look really good. Um, so if they're approved, um, how will they be um, used? Um, just as a, an aside, uh, Eduardo Cohn, who's an anthropologist and um, interested in studying uh, shamans who use these, um, says that in the jungle, the doctor takes the drug, not the patient. So that's a whole nother model. Um, so if it's approved, it'll be in specialized treatment centers that are FDA approved and also with highly trained specialists that are FDA approved. Um, and like I said, these um, uh, indications look promising. Um, so, and these are the probable contraindications, uh, psychotic disorders, bipolar disorder, history psychosis, borderline, um, and significant cardiovascular disease. Um, so you would think about using psychedelics in people who are kind of stuck and ruminating um, and unhappy about it. And you don't think about it for people who have a, pretty loose sense of self. Um, and you have to be very aware of uh, medication interactions, um, especially drugs with any serotonergic activity. Um, I think there's a lot of questions of how these will be used. Um, one is that these drugs have been shown to improve quality of life. They improve spirituality. They improve relationships. Um, our um, feeling um, 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 a part of the thing, uh, of uh, everything. Um, and these are people that don't have any psychiatric diagnosis. I wonder um, if we'll be have anything to offer these guys um, who are interested in um, just improving their lives. And then what about these guys like in the depression studies um, who um, looks like they might benefit from refresher sessions? Will these be allowed? And if so, how often? Um, and um, um, and what will these sessions look like? Will they look any different? And then there's patients who really just don't have a mystical experience. What's that all about? Um, is there some physiological difference? Do they just need higher doses? Um, how will you figure that out? Um, might there be some benefit of combining um, um, psychedelics with meditation? Uh, when do we use entheogens? When do we use enactogens? Um, and then um, um, is there anything that these um, drugs have to offer people with schizophrenia, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, and borderline? Um, so we will see, and I'm looking forward to it. So I'm going to spend a few minutes um, talking about meditation. Um, this cow is saying, ooh, om, oh, om. Oh. And the chicken says, is that cow meditating? And the pig says, uh, he's dyslexic. Um, most of this section comes from this book. It's called Altered Traits. It's written by Richard Davidson and Dan Goldman. Uh, Richard Davidson has been studying the brains of meditators for 40 years. Um, Dan Goldman um, is the author of the books, uh, Social Intelligence and Emotional Intelligence. Um, so he's a scientific writer. Uh, these two guys have been um, friends since uh, their college days. 
and they were also founding members of the board of the Dalai Lama's uh, Mind and Life Institute. Um, thousands of years ago, when people started to meditate in India, um, they were doing it more as a way of trying to transcend self um, than uh, as a way to make self better. Um, and we seem to be in our culture much more interested in making the self feel better. Um, these um, studies, um, uh, meditation isn't just one thing. Um, so it's really complicated to study. Um, for one thing, the amount of time people have meditated makes a huge difference. And Richard Davidson divides meditators into beginner, which uh, people that might have taken a uh, like an eight-week class in mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, then there's a the long-term meditators. These are guys who might meditate for, um, say, an hour a day for six, seven years um, and might have gone to a, a, a retreat here and there. And then there's these Olympic meditators who really meditate their entire lives. Um, and um, they have up to like 50,000 hours of meditation. And they've done things like these three-year, three-month, uh, three-week and three-day long retreats um, where they meditate every day for eight hours. Um, and then um, the results you see also vary with the type of meditation. And Richard Davidson divides types into attentional, constructive and deconstructive. Attentional is when you focus on something, maybe your breath, uh, maybe um, 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 maybe a flame, maybe a koan, maybe a, uh, a mantra, um, maybe just uh, being very mindful of how your thoughts work. Um, and then constructive are more about sort of uh, evoking certain um, qualities like uh, loving kindness or compassion. And uh, deconstructive are more geared towards uh, loss of self. Um, if you ask these Olympic meditators, um, um, if you talk to them, what you see is that they, they embody these uh, qualities like selflessness, equanimity, kindness, compassion, uh, humility and loving presence, uh, not, not too bad. Uh, but even beginner meditators um, show um, um, improvement in uh, some of these things. Um, there are some things that are really dose dependent that you don't really see them until you meditated for 50,000 hours. Um, 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 but these um, these results that you see in beginning meditators, they tend to depend on what kind of meditation is practiced. Um, and these effects are often short-lived if people don't keep the practice up. Uh, Davidson and Goldman, they use a sports analogy. Um, so if um, if you go out and knock, um, you have a friend that goes out and knocks a baseball around with uh, his friends on the weekends in the summertime, you wouldn't expect him to have the same kind of skill level as somebody who plays for the Rockies. Um, and it's the same kind of thing with meditation. You wouldn't um, expect somebody who's only meditated for eight hours to have the same effects as somebody who's meditated for 50,000. And then um, you also wouldn't expect somebody who's made it to the pros in baseball to, um, to automatically be a, um, uh, an expert skier or an expert saxophone player. Um, and I know this seems obvious, but um, back when they first started studying meditation, the people who studied it um, had all these ideas about what meditators, what qualities they might have. And without ever asking the meditators, they just brought them into their lab and did EEG or cortisol studies or whatever. And um, um, and um, did things like they studied their capacity for ESP or capacity to levitate. Um, and for the most part, the meditators uh, didn't even know what they were talking about. Um, uh, just as an aside, uh, a lot of people think of complex um, brain as this uh, goal to be achieved um, and that it's uh, just one thing. But if you talk to um, these Olympic meditators, what they will tell you is that they are continually finding out more and more about this this uh, complex brain, um, that they're always surprised that there's something else. It's an evolving process and it's as varied as our normal uh, waking, um, waking, our normal um, default mode kind of experience. 
So I'll present a few studies. Um, so Davidson divides uh, the research into um, looking at uh, these four different categories. One is loss of self, one is compassion, one is attention, and the other is stress reduction. And the brain parts that tend to be involved are the default mode network, where we spend a lot of time talking about, the amygdala. Um, there's these uh, EG findings, these high amplitude gamma waves, and then there's the nucleus accumbens. So what you see with default mode is that people, even after eight weeks of mindfulness training, that the connections between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the default mode are increased. So even just after eight weeks of training, people will have more control over their default mode. And then long-term meditators, you'll see that um, they're able to um, go into complex brain during meditation. And then these Olympic meditators, it looks like they're, um, um, they're never in default mode. Their default mode is sort of the connections are um, just disrupted and they live in complex brain. Uh, what you see with amygdala is really interesting. People that practice, even for a short time, um, people that practice um, compassion meditation, their amygdala actually becomes more activated. Um, and people that practice um, mindfulness meditation, their amygdala actually becomes deactivated, less activated. But what you see in both of these conditions is there's more connections between the front part of our brain, our prefrontal cortex, and the amygdala. So I think what's going on is that there's more control. So if you're wanting to be empathic and compassionate, um, you want your amygdala to be more active, whereas um, if you um, want to be on something, you want it to be less active. Um, interestingly, in Olympic meditators, their amygdala are pretty small. They've shrunken. And what you see um, when they are being compassionate is you see more insula activity. And the insula is correlated with sort of the map of our viscera, what we feel like inside, what our stomach and chest feels like, what our muscles feel like, that sort of thing. Um, these high amplitude gamma waves are really interesting. Um, so Richie Davidson found this. Um, and what he discovered is that um, in sort of a, a, a normal brain, when we have an aha moment, when we um, sort of tie things together in a new way, um, we get this burst for a few seconds of this high amplitude gamma waves. This is like 40 frequency, uh, excuse me, 40 hertz EEG frequency. Um, and, um, and the burst will be localized to one part of the brain. Um, but in these Olympic meditators, they have these high amplitude gamma waves all the time. They, um, they have even more of them uh, when they're meditating, uh, but they're there all the time, even during sleep. And what a lot of these yogis and roshis talk about is that um, they are aware even during sleep. I don't know if this is an EEG correlate of that or not. And then this last finding, um, one that's near and dear to my heart, is that in Olympic meditators, their nucleus accumbens shrinks. The nucleus accumbens is uh, what Newsweek called the pleasure center of our brain. Um, and the nucleus accumbens is associated with um, every brain study on addiction. It shows that the um, dopamine receptors in the nucleus accumbens are downregulated. Um, so um, I think of Olympic meditators as being the opposite of addiction um, with regard to the nucleus accumbens. Um, most of the studies in our culture are using uh, mindfulness meditation to treat things like stress, depression, and anxiety and pain. Um, there are some adverse reactions, and uh, I think if you're going to recommend meditation to a client or if your client is meditating, um, it's good to know about these. I can't really think of any real contraindications, um, although um, every retreat I've ever been to, um, um, the meditation teachers have had um, somebody around who's um, there for people who are having trouble. And I know at one retreat there was uh, somebody who had a psychotic break. Um, so the adverse effects, um, um, sort of while people are meditating, difficult memories might come up um, or difficult feelings. Um, and like I said, rarely a psychosis.
um, there's this kind of long-term thing that happens. So people have been meditating for a few years, might see a lot of benefit in the beginning, but then just start to get despondent and um, might even have weird physical symptoms. Um, and uh, they borrowed from the Christian uh, literature this uh, term, the dark night of the soul, to describe this. And I've seen meditation teachers do one of two things when it comes to these things. Um, one is meditation teachers might say, you need to just stop meditating and go get go get grounded, go work in the garden or go carry rocks around or something. Um, and then sometimes they will say, um, this is just a normal part of the experience, just go with it. And I think they just use a lot of uh, intuition and also like what the intent of the meditator might be to uh, decide which way they go. Um, Dr. Willoughby Britton um, at the at Brown University has uh, dedicated her career to um, studying adverse effects of meditation. Um, she's developed something called uh, Cheetah House. They have a website. So if you have any clients who are struggling with meditation in some way, that's a great resource. Um, but all in all, adverse or pretty effects are um, uncommon. Uh, one thing about apps, or a couple things about apps, um, the one thing about apps is um, they're awesome, but um, 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 a lot of them purport to give all kinds of benefits. Um, and uh, one thing that can happen is what one of the things that Willoughby Britton talks about. One thing that can happen is that um, um, people won't get the benefits they're looking for and they'll go into these weird shame spirals around there's something wrong with me. Um, there's a uh, um, there's some reason why I can't do this. Um, and without a meditation teacher, um, that can be real. Let's just say you're okay. Uh, that can be difficult. Um, and then another thing that she talks about um, is that, um, say, for example, um, um, somebody uh, was traumatized and they held their breath um, during the trauma. And then they um, go to these apps um, and they're... Um, they're told um, um, uh, to uh, concentrate on their breath. Um, well, um, they of course might have recurrence of trauma. And uh, what she suggests for these people is just that they uh, change their technique. Um, because of all the findings with uh, mindfulness meditation, um, we um, in the West have developed mindfulness psychotherapy. Um, and there's a lot of research that shows um, improvement with these modalities uh, to treat anxiety, stress, and pain. Um, these are often noted, called the uh, third wave of CBT, the first wave being behavioral therapy, the second being cognitive behavioral, and the third being mindfulness-based. And these are things like mindfulness-based um, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectic behavioral therapy, and acceptance and commitment therapy. saying a few things. Um, one is that um, psychedelics and meditation show us that these forays out of default mode and into complex brain um, lead to the fewer feelings of separateness, more feelings of being part of something bigger, more compassion, more closeness to the people we love, and more meaning and purpose. Um, but in our society, we're sort of bombarded daily with these messages that discomfort means there's something wrong. Um, that it's an abnormality. For example, advertising tells us over and over that um, if we're not feeling all right, we need to go buy something. Uh, we need to change the way we look or the way we smell. Uh, we have to take a pill uh, to make that discomfort go away. And then I've noticed a lot of television and movies is all about um, people struggling with difficult feelings. Um, but there's a weird kind of subtle underlying message here, and that's that the biggest priority in our life should be the avoidance of pain. And um, this kind of message feeds right into our default mode. Um, so psychedelics and meditation, they do give us relief from discomfort, but I think they also tell us there's a whole different way to experience our lives. We really don't have to take our subtext so seriously. We can really dive into our experience instead of constantly um, living in fear of it and running from it. I like the way Mark Manson says it. He says, um, the desire, excuse me, the desire for more positive experience is in itself a negative experience. And paradoxically, the acceptance of negative experience is in itself a positive experience. 
And I would add that protecting ourselves from negative experience is in itself a negative experience. And paradoxically, opening it up to all experience, whether positive or negative, is in itself a positive experience. And I also love the way Marie Howe said it. Uh, Marie Howe said, um, that when we are faced with the unbearable, we only have one choice, and that's that we either let it break our heart open or we let it break our heart closed. Um, in Buddhism, they talk about trading and suffering for pain, um, but I think it's really about just trading suffering for pain and joy. Um, this is the brain with a leash on the heart saying, um, don't do it, you got hurt last time. Um, as Dan Goldman says in Altered Traits, he says, um, this doesn't mean that we have a life without problems. Uh, we still have to pay bills. We still have to deal with unrequited love. Uh, we don't have to, we just don't have to live in constant fear of our own internal states. And it's not like that fear ever really protects us anyway. We still get our hearts broken. Um, and psychedelics show that even a brief period of time um, away um, from our default mode and into complex brain is, uh, uh, leads to contentment and more flexibility and more openness. And, uh, and there's something about like looking back at our um, subtext of, from that place and seeing, that, um, seeing them for what they really are. And we so we really don't have to become aesthetics and meditate for 50,000 hours. Um, 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 I think, um, and, and I think that, um, like I said before, I think we sort of in a normal life that we have these experiences. I think we just pay more attention to them. And I think when we have them, uh, we can use it to look back and, and see ourselves with more compassion. And I also think that we're really a lot more fragile than we want to think we are. Um, that childhood fragility um, never really goes away. It just sort of hides out in our subtext. And, um, so um, it's really understandable that we wouldn't want to go there. Um, it takes a lot of courage to be that vulnerable. And I'll just end by saying that uh, with proper set and setting, psychedelics um, have been shown to be safe, a few side effects and pretty remarkable results. Um, and they show us that we can be more flexible, open and connected and compassionate. And I'm just really looking forward to the next few years um, um, as they are approved, hopefully, by the FDA and that there's more people who are suffering who can benefit. And then last, I'll just uh, refer you guys again to maps.org. Um, there's uh, hundreds of papers um, available on that website. You go to the resources tab and then uh, click on bibliography and it will take you to um, um, the uh, papers. So I'll open it up to questions again. Um, I'm sorry I ran a little bit over. Let's see. Here's one. Uh, cannabis seems to cause psychedelic experience in large doses. Um, yes. Um, um, I, um, I think uh, cannabis addiction does exist. Um, and um, can be pretty problematic, mostly because uh, we don't think it's addictive. Um, one of the things about cannabis is um, there are some faster acting components um, like uh, 50 THC and 2550 THC, um, but THC itself lasts for um, up to a month. And so um, the withdrawal from cannabis um, doesn't really kick in till about a week. And what I've noticed is that people, when they try to stop smoking pot, will at about a week start to say, you know, I'm a little anxious. I think it's time to smoke again. I think what they're actually experiencing at that point is, um, um, is cannabis withdrawal. Um, so um, given that, um, might there be um, any benefit to using cannabis um, like you would use um, psychedelics? Um, maybe, um, but I think that um, LSD and psilocybin would be um, much more, much, much safer because of the addictive properties. Um, any research with the Vietnam vets comparing PTSD outcomes for vets who use psychedelics during combat versus those that interesting question. I don't know of any, um, but I think I will look that up after this talk, uh, see if there's anything on maps about that. 
Um, why is ketamine so expensive? Um, so yes, ketamine itself is actually dirt cheap. It's been around forever as a veterinary drug. Um, what um, Big Pharma did was that they realized that as with every drug, there's two enantiomers. There's the S enantiomer and the um, D enantiomer. Um, and that for some reason, humans are responsive to the S enantiomer and not the D enantiomer. Um, this is the same with um, Celexa and, um, and Lexapro. Lexapro is just the S enantiomer of Celexa. And so they've uh, isolated the S enantiomer and they said, this is a new drug. They put it in these little um, nasal things. And why it's so expensive is because big pharma can get a lot of money from it. Uh, um, and um, ketamine itself, if you use it IV and IM, is still pretty expensive because you got to pay for the cost of, uh, of injecting. It's a two hour session. Um, and so that runs more about like $800 a session, but insurance doesn't pay for that. Um, Non-responders screen for the MTHFR gene. Um, not that I know of. Um, I can't think of a reason why um, um, having an abnormal uh, MTHFR gene would change the psychedelic experience. Um, uh, MT, um, methylfolate reductase um, is an enzyme used in the brain to um, um, uh, to help us deal with inflammation. And there's a huge um, amount of study out there showing that, um, not huge, but not the growing interest all um, depression um, is related to the amount of inflammation in our brain. And people that have an abnormal form of this enzyme um, aren't able to metabolize um, the um, uh, buildup of inflammatory products in our brain, and those people um, uh, can get depressed. Um, so those studies haven't been done. It's an interesting question. Um, since uh, psychedelics work by such a different mechanism, um, I wouldn't think there'd be a, a problem there. Um, I don't see any reason uh, why, if that does come to pass, um, that you couldn't give people L-methylfolate um, and, and then give them psychedelics. Um, how would a person volunteer for a study? Um, again, I would, um, um, the, you can find these studies online um, and um, what you do is you just um, call them up and tell them you're interested um, and um, if they're taking clients, they will um, interview and decide if you fit in. Um, I'm not sure that I understand LSD and PTSD long term. Um, effective six to nine, okay. Um, this was actually MDMA, not LSD in the PTSD. And um, what I was saying is that, um, so after the study, uh, people show um, um, improvement. Um, but um, for the most part, when we do PTSD studies and you follow people, they sort of stay at about the same level unless you add additional medications. Uh, some people might get better and some people might get worse, but on average, um, people stay about the same. After these MDMA studies, so um, it's um, so the whole process takes what about um, um, I don't know a couple of months. If you then follow six to nine months after the end of the study, what you see is that people got better and better and better and better. Um, and this is something you don't see. Uh, for the most part, what you see instead. Um, uh, like I said, is that people sort of stay at baseline. And the thought behind that is that there's something about going through this treatment that people actually learn techniques to treat themselves, to, um, to treat their own disorder, um, and will continue to use that. So even after they're not being treated anymore, they will um, continue to get better. I hope that answers that question. Um, it seems that uh, studies have participants mostly white, middle, upper uh, income, and I would add um, well-educated. Um, and yes, that's a problem. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Um, and uh, we have to do something about that. Um, are there comparison studies between indigenous communities uh, that use and people who use it to treat 
um, mental health challenges. Um, like I said, the model in the jungle is that the, the, um, the shaman takes the drug. Um, so it's a completely different model, um, but um, evidently people in the jungle get better as well. Um, Uh, where would a person find a listing of certified practitioners? Well, there is none yet because it hasn't been FDA approved. Um, and I have no idea how you would contact the uh, Psychedelic Underground. I'm not sure um, what this is. Um, any word if LVNV will be a state that this is legal in. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. So maybe you could ask me again. Um, uh, am I aware of mindfulness-based uh, relapse um, prevention? Um, I'm not, I'm guessing, let's see, it says, uh, it seems always left out of the MB list. Uh, I'm trained in and have good outcomes. I would guess so. Um, thanks for mentioning that. Um, uh, can you give examples of ways in which we can pay attention to complex brain in a daily way? Um, what I will sometimes say is um, that we, you know, we're sort of going back and forth between working on a task and daydreaming. So um, in those daydream moments, if we become aware of, oh, I'm daydreaming, instead of going right back and working on the task, um, just sort of be aware of your environment and, and especially your internal environment. And you know, what does my body feel like right now? What does my gut feel like? What does my chest feel like? What do my muscles feel like? What does my head feel like? Um, and also if you're out hiking, um, to, um, just sort of, um, and you're feeling pretty good, um, just to say, hey, wait a minute. Um, I'm actually feeling something here. Um, it's that kind of thing. Um, Long-term meditators struggle with motivation and proactiveness due to uh, shrunken amygdala. Oh, oh do long-term meditators struggle with um, um, motivation and proactiveness due to shrunken amygdala? Um, it really doesn't look that way. Um, it looks like, um, like I said, the insula is more active. So, um, and these are Olympic meditators, not long-term. Um, um, and so um, it seems like they relate to the world more from a, a sense of their body than their amygdala. I think I've got time for one more question. Um, what's the best way to go off marijuana addiction and why do most not recognize it's, uh, it, it, that it's addictive? Um, um, I'm fond of 12-step programs. Um, I think it's extraordinarily difficult to get off a pot. Um, and I think part of the problem is what I was talking about, that people really don't experience withdrawal for about a week. Um, with heroin, you know the next day that you need heroin. You know what withdrawal is. Um, same with alcohol. Um, um, with, um, so if you're getting the shakes um, in the morning after drink, um, a, a day of drinking, um, you know that a, a drink will make those go away. Um, with pot, since it's a week out, um, and since our, um, we're programmed to, um, um, to, uh, um, uh, to relate things that have happened only within about a day of our experiences from Psychology 101, we have a conditioned um, stimulus and a conditioned response. If the conditioned response isn't for a week after the conditioned stimulus, you're not going to relate that response to that stimulus. You're going to relate it to something that you had before. Um, uh, the day before. And so um, I, I think it's really difficult to think of marijuana as a problem. And besides, there's something about marijuana that's sort of, it's like if you were to um, anthropomorphize marijuana and put it in your psyche, it keeps saying, I'm not a problem, I'm not a problem, I'm not a problem. Um, so there are 12-step um, programs out there. Um, if you need rehab, that's an option. Um, but it looks like I'm out of time. Thanks for all the questions, guys, and it was really great being with you.